Chapter 1. Tensions Ignite Once upon a time, there were two neighboring lands known as Britain and France. Their relationship was anything but harmonious. Characterized by tensions and simmering rivalries that had festered over generations. On one fateful day, the winds of conflict blew strong over the land of Britain. And its leaders made a decision that would shape the course of history. You see, Britain, despite its determination, found itself in a precarious position. France, its neighbor across the Channel, held a formidable advantage in terms of sheer numbers. France boasted a population nearly four times the size of Britain's. It was like a mighty giant, towering over its smaller, island-dwelling counterpart. But why did Britain, seemingly the underdog in this story, decide to provoke a conflict with the behemoth that was France? The answer lay in the complex web of medieval politics, ambition, and rivalry. Both Britain and France had long-standing aspirations to expand their dominions, to carve out a place of prominence on the European stage. Territorial disputes, a common affliction of the time, played a pivotal role. The two lands found themselves at odds over valuable territories that were considered strategically crucial or economically prosperous. Control over these regions meant control over trade routes, resources, and markets, vital components of medieval prosperity. But perhaps, beneath it all, lay the weight of historical animosities. Centuries of grudges and historical rivalries had shaped their interactions, and these wounds were not easily forgotten. So, Britain, despite being the smaller and seemingly weaker of the two, chose to challenge its mighty neighbor across the channel. They were determined to assert their own place in history, to stake a claim to the resources and territories they believed were rightfully theirs. They had special people called knights. These knights were really good at fighting like the superheroes we read about. They wore heavy armor and carried long spears to battle. But when our story happened, Britain didn't have as many of these special knights as it did before. Knights were indeed remarkable figures in medieval society. And they played a significant role in the conflict. The path to knighthood was a rigorous and lifelong journey. Young boys, often from noble or knightly families, would start their training as pages. As pages, they learned basic skills such as horsemanship, swordsmanship, and etiquette under the guidance of experienced knights. The decline in the number of knights in Britain during the late Middle Ages can be attributed to several factors including changes in warfare and the shift in the social and political landscape. Chapter 2. Edward's Gambit In the year 1339, the ambitious King Edward III of England embarked on a daring campaign that would forever be remembered as a pivotal moment in history. His aim was to engage the formidable nation of France in a strategic game of wits and cunning rather than a straightforward clash of armies. Edward knew that to confront the mighty French forces head-on would be a perilous endeavor. The French army, with its vast numbers and formidable reputation, posed a daunting challenge. So, the English king devised a clever strategy, one that relied on subtlety and guile rather than brute force. With approximately 12 
000 soldiers in tow. Edward III led his forces not directly to the front lines of the French army, but to the unsuspecting villages and towns scattered throughout the French countryside. These villages, he reason, were not as well defended as the formidable French army, and they could serve as strategic pawns in his grand scheme. As they descended upon these seemingly vulnerable settlements, Edward's soldiers executed a plan that was both cunning and devious. Instead of engaging in direct combat, they engaged in a different kind of warfare, warfare that targeted the heart and soul of the French kingdom. They ransacked these unfortified villages, pillaging and plundering valuable resources. But their campaign was not limited to looting alone. In a calculated move, they set these villages ablaze, the flames of destruction dancing high into the sky. It was a ruthless but calculated maneuver, akin to a strategic gambit in a game of chess. The aim of Edward III and his soldiers was not merely to inflict damage for the sake of it. They sought to weaken the French kingdom in a different manner, undermining its strength and resilience from within. By targeting these seemingly insignificant villages, they disrupted the French supply lines, crippled their resources, and sowed fear and uncertainty among the French populace. Edward's gambit was audacious, but it demonstrated a profound understanding of the art of war. It was a stark departure from the traditional battles of knights and castles, a shift towards a more calculated and strategic form of warfare. As the flames of these burning villages illuminated the French night sky, the stage was set for a protracted conflict where cunning and strategy would play as critical a role as courage and might. Edward III and his soldiers had declared that this war would be fought on their terms, and the world watched with bated breath to see the outcome of this audacious gambit. Chapter 3 King's Fury and Knightly Code as the flames from the burning English raids continued to cast an ominous glow over the French countryside, King Philip VI of France seethed with anger. England's relentless pillaging and destruction of their villages had ignited a fiery rage within the French monarch. He knew it was time to take action. To muster the full might of his realm against this audacious foe. With resolve burning as fiercely as the torches lighting up the night sky, King Philip VI made a fateful decision. He summoned an army of unprecedented size, amassing approximately 30 000 formidable warriors, a significant portion of whom were the renowned knights of France. Imagine for a moment, dear reader, the image of these French knights, a sight to behold. Straight out of the pages of a heroic storybook. Clad in heavy, gleaming armor that glistened in the sunlight. They were the embodiment of courage and valor. In their hands, they wielded long, imposing spears that weighed heavily, ready to thrust them into the heart of battle. But these knights were not just warriors. They were adherents of a sacred code known as Enquat, chivalry. Enquat, this code was more than just a set of rules, it was a way of life. A creed that defined their very existence. For them, chivalry was the essence of what it meant to be a knight. At its core, Chivalry demanded honor and bravery on the battlefield. Knights swore never to turn their backs on the enemy, to face adversity head on, and to fight valiantly for their cause. Truthfulness was another pillar of their code, they were expected always to speak the truth, even in the most dire of circumstances. 
chivalry was their superhero code. A set of principles that guided their actions and set them apart as exemplars of nobility and valor. These knights weren't just powerful warriors, they were beacons of honor. Befitting the stories and legends that would be told about them for generations to come. And so, as the tension between Britain and France escalated, a fascinating dichotomy emerged. On one side, the French knights, their armor polished to a shine, their coat of chivalry etched into their very souls, stood ready to face the English with honor and valor. On the other side, the English knights, while no less skilled, were employing crafty tactics and cunning strategies. It was a clash of styles, a testament to the diverse approaches to warfare in this age of knights and castles, a time when honor, courage, and clever tactics would intermingle on the grand stage of history. This, dear reader, was a chapter from a bygone era where knights and their noble codes shaped the destiny of nations and legends were born amidst the clash of steel and honor. Chapter 4 Clash at Cressy Six months after the resolute King Philip VI of France had mustered his formidable army of 30 000 soldiers, King Edward III of England had marshaled approximately 10 000 troops including around two oo knights clad in sturdy armor. The stage was set for a fateful encounter, a clash of might and strategy that would go down in history as the Battle of Cressy. Unfolding in the year 1346, as the English forces converged on the battlefield first, King Edward III faced a crucial decision. He strategically positioned his camp on a slightly elevated hill, the left side of the battlefield. This vantage point granted his troops an advantageous position, with a commanding view of the terrain. The battlefield itself was characterized by a distinctive feature, a modest hill that rose like a solitary cloud, standing at an elevation of about 20 to 60 meters above sea level. This landscape would soon become the backdrop for a historic confrontation. Sizing up the situation, King Edward III issued a bold command to his soldiers, dismount from their horses. This tactical decision may seem counterintuitive, as horses provided a swift means of charging into battle. However, it was also harder to defend oneself while mounted. The English king's choice reflected a shrewd assessment of the circumstances. King Philip VI of France was not unaware of this strategic choice. His scouts had brought him vital information about the English disposition, including their decision to dismount. In response, King Philip suggested a course of action to his soldiers. He advised them to rest that night and advance toward the English army the following evening. However, within the French army, a challenge arose. Some nights, despite the king's counsel to halt and rest, continued to move forward. This puzzling defiance of the king's orders begged the question, why did these knights persist in their advance? There were several reasons behind this disarray within the French ranks. Firstly, shedding heavy armor and donning it again swiftly was a laborious task. The king himself did not wish to change his attire, and the commanders were preoccupied with providing support and organizing their forces. Furthermore, the chaos of the battlefield often resulted in communication breakdowns. The king's orders did not reach every corner of the sprawling army. 
and amidst the tumult of war, messages could easily become muddled and distorted. And so, on the eve of the Battle of Cressy, the stage was set for a momentous clash between the English and French armies. King Edward III's strategic positioning and tactical choice to dismount his troops had given him an early advantage. But the outcome of this historic confrontation would depend on more than just tactics, it would be shaped by the actions and decisions of thousands of brave knights and soldiers on both sides. Chapter 5 Miscommunication and Chaos Communicating with an army as vast as the French forces numbering around 30 000 soldiers was a monumental challenge amidst the sprawling ranks of knights and soldiers a complex interplay of motivations and circumstances fueled their actions many of the french knights were driven by a powerful incentive one that transcended the chivalric code they held dear france at that time, was gripped by the hardships of a prolonged period of food scarcity known as a famine. Desperate times had led to desperate measures, and capturing enemy combatants had become a means of securing much needed funds. These knights hoped to take adversaries as prisoners and demand ransoms, payments that would alleviate their country's financial woes. This pursuit of wealth added another layer to their motivation as they eagerly charged forward. The French knights. Their sights set on capturing valuable prisoners. Showed no hesitation. With the prospect of financial relief propelling them. They surged toward the hill where the English soldiers stood positioned. King Philip VI of France. Perhaps feeling a tinge of embarrassment at the unbridled rush of his knights, recognized that he could no longer control their forward momentum. With a heavy heart, he issued the fateful order for them to attack. Yet, amid this chaotic rush, King Philip VI held a belief, a belief in the prowess of the three OOO Genoese mercenaries he had enlisted. These mercenaries, hailing from the city of Genoa in Italy, had earned a formidable reputation as formidable fighters throughout Europe. They bore a distinctive weapon known as a crossbow, a formidable piece of artillery that resembled a massive bow capable of launching arrows with lethal precision. This weapon, however, came with its complexities. Loading and firing a crossbow was a time-consuming process that demanded accuracy. These Genoese mercenaries, now on the front lines, faced a daunting challenge. Opposite them stood seven OOO English archers, each armed with a different kind of bow, a longbow. The longbow was renowned for its rapid fire rate capable of unleashing a storm of arrows that could obscure the sky with their sheer volume. This formidable archery corps posed a formidable obstacle to the Genoese crossbowmen, who labored to load and fire their weapons with the same speed and precision as their English counterparts. In the midst of this tumultuous clash, miscommunication and the clash of weapons technology added further layers of complexity to the unfolding battle. As the Battle of Cressy raged on, the fate of these knights and soldiers hung in the balance. Their actions driven by a complex tapestry of motivations and circumstances. Chapter 6 Rain Soaked Bows As the fateful Battle of Cressy unfolded, the Genoese mercenaries faced an unfortunate twist of fate a rain shower had soaked the battlefield prior to the conflict. While rain may be a welcome relief in other circumstances, it proved detrimental to the effectiveness of the Genoese crossbows. 
these intricate weapons relied on taut strings for power and accuracy. And the moisture from the rain rendered them less effective and more challenging to wield effectively. As the battle commenced, the Genoese mercenaries struggled to respond adequately to the relentless onslaught of arrows from the skilled English archers. The damp strings of their crossbows made it difficult to load and fire their weapons with the precision required for battle. This predicament added to the chaos and confusion on the battlefield. The situation took a further turn for the worse when the Genoese mercenaries, grappling with their compromised weaponry, began a retreat from the battlefield. Witnessing this, the French commander issued a pivotal order. He instructed his knights to break through the ranks of the retreating mercenaries, clearing a path for the French advance. The intention was for these knights to engage the English soldiers positioned on the hill. However, in the tumultuous heat of battle, misunderstanding and miscommunication cast a shadow over this plan. The sounds of the retreating mercenaries, mixed with the clamor of conflict, were misconstrued as screams of attack by some of the French knights. In the midst of the chaos, some knights became disoriented and startled. Tragedy struck as a result of this misunderstanding. Some of the French knights tumbled from their horses and slid down the hill. Their graceful charge disrupted by confusion. The arrows from the English archers added to the turmoil, tripping up horses and adding to the disorder. The English foot soldiers, capitalizing on this disarray, engaged the fallen knights, leading to a disorganized and chaotic scene on the battlefield. In the throes of battle, unexpected twists and turns unfolded, a stark reminder that warfare is often unpredictable. Influenced by the weather, the choices of commanders, and the unforeseen circumstances of the moment. The Battle of Cressy serves as a testament to the many surprises that history has in store. Reminding us that the outcomes of battles are shaped by a complex interplay of factors both expected and unexpected. Chapter 7 Consequences of Cressy and the Subjugation of Calais The Battle of Cressy A clash marked by unexpected twists and turns left a profound and devastating impact on France. The outcome was an undeniable victory for England. An outcome few had anticipated or foreseen. The cost to the French was staggering, with approximately 4.000 soldiers falling in the battle, some fleeing desperately with grievous wounds, and even a few bearing arrows lodged in their necks. It was a day of hardship and sorrow for the French. In the wake of this resounding triumph, King Edward III of England turned his gaze toward his next target. The city of Calais, nestled in the northern reaches of France. Calais held a unique strategic significance, serving as a vital bridge between France and England. Its location made it a crucial point for potential future invasions into the heart of France. The resilient inhabitants of Calais were determined to resist the impending English onslaught. But the victorious English army proved relentless. Eventually, after a hard fought struggle, they seized control of the city. King Edward III returned to England, bearing the spoils of victory that his soldiers had gleaned from the conquered city. It was a time of jubilation and celebration throughout England with the spoils of war serving as a tangible testament to their triumph. Following this conquest, a period of relative peace descended upon both England and France, lasting for approximately seven years. 
such moments of respite were not uncommon in the aftermath of major battles. They offered both nations the opportunity to regroup, assess their strategies, and contemplate their next moves. It was a pause, a temporary cessation of hostilities, amid the tumultuous landscape of medieval warfare, a moment of reflection and preparation for whatever the future might hold. Chapter 8 Black Death In the year following the English conquest of Calais, a dreadful and unprecedented catastrophe befell Europe, an event that would go down in history as the Black Death. This was no ordinary illness, it was a relentless epidemic. A scourge that swiftly spread its deadly grip across the continent. The Black Death was a grim reality that affected an enormous number of people. And its impact was nothing short of catastrophic. This merciless plague was so virulent that it claimed the lives of approximately one-third of all the people in Europe. To put it in perspective, Imagine a world where one out of every three people you knew had succumbed to this relentless scourge. It was a time of unparalleled sorrow and devastation. The outbreak of the Black Death had consequences that extended far beyond individual suffering and loss. Both England and France, embroiled in their long-standing conflict, were compelled to halt their hostilities. The gravity of the Black Death was so severe that it forced both nations to recognize the futility of their ongoing strife. In the face of this monumental crisis, they had no choice but to redirect their attention toward the urgent task of caring for their afflicted populations and confronting the immense challenge posed by the disease. The Black Death cast a long, dark shadow over Europe plunging the continent into a period of profound sorrow and hardship. It was a time when the ceaseless clashes between nations gave way to a shared struggle for survival. As both England and France grappled with the unimaginable toll of this devastating epidemic, it was a time of great sadness and immense difficulty for everyone. A somber chapter in the annals of history. Chapter 9 Shifting Leadership and Renewed Conflict As the grip of the Black Death gradually loosened its hold on Europe around the year 1355, the English made a consequential decision, they opted to resume their hostilities against France. However, this time, it was not King Edward III at the helm of the English army. Instead, it was his eldest son, known as the Prince of Wales, who assumed leadership over the English soldiers. With King Edward III's advancing age, his son took up the mantle of command. In France, around the same time, a significant change occurred in leadership. Philip VI who had previously faced off against England, passed away. His son, Jean II, ascended to the throne as the new King of France. Jean II, displaying a resolute spirit, was not inclined to yield to England's challenges, and he stood firm in the face of the formidable English prince who had earned a reputation for his unyielding toughness. It was this English prince who initiated the renewed conflict. He launched his campaign from Bordeaux, a pivotal starting point, and led his army on a remarkable journey that spanned approximately 1.000 kilometers through the southern regions of France. Along the way, his soldiers engaged in a practice that could be likened to pillaging, taking resources from numerous villages. It was akin to a kind of expropriation as they traversed a circuitous route from the western to the eastern parts of southern France. 
The resumption of hostilities between England and France marked a pivotal moment in their enduring struggle for supremacy. With new leaders at the forefront and the scars of the Black Death still fresh in the collective memory, the two nations once again found themselves on the precipice of conflict, poised to write another chapter in the annals of their storied rivalry. Chapter 10 The Battle of Leadership and Strategy in the face of the relentless actions of the Black Prince, King Jean II of France could not remain passive. He recognized the urgency of the situation and made a resolute decision, to assemble a formidable army and pursue the English forces under the leadership of the Prince. This choice inexorably set the stage for yet another showdown between the two sides. And in the crisp September era of 1356, they clashed once more on the battlefield. These historical events serve as a testament to the intricate interplay of factors that shaped conflicts and battles throughout history. It is a vivid reminder that warfare is not solely determined by military strategies but also influenced by broader forces, including epidemics and the distinct personalities of the leaders involved. History Indeed is a rich tapestry woven with countless threads of complexity and intrigue. At this juncture in history, the English army, led by the indomitable Black Prince, numbered around seven soldiers. In contrast, the army commanded by King Jean II of France was twice as large. However, History had offered a cautionary tale to King Jean II's father, Philip VI, who had faced a similar situation in the past, only to suffer defeat despite the numerical advantage. To avoid repeating the same costly mistake, King Jean II made a strategic shift. In a departure from the tactics of his predecessors, King Jean II emphasized the use of infantry, soldiers who fought on foot. This change in strategy was designed to leverage the advantages of foot soldiers and adapt to the unique dynamics of the battlefield. The stage was now set for a battle that would not only test military prowess but also the wisdom of leadership and the art of strategy in a complex and ever-evolving landscape of conflict. Chapter 11 Infantry tactics meet terrain challenges. King Jean II of France's new strategy echoed the English approach seen at the Battle of Crecy, it involved dismounting from horses and engaging the enemy on foot. While it might have seemed like a sound plan, this strategy encountered significant challenges on the battlefield. Once again, the English forces had chosen a tactical advantage, they were positioned on higher ground. To reach the English, the French infantry had to traverse a vast expanse of wet and muddy terrain. Picture trying to walk through an exceptionally muddy area, it's a challenging and arduous task. To say the least. As the French knights descended the hill, they found themselves mired in the swampy land. Fatigue set in, and the clinging mud made it incredibly difficult for them to move. Tragically, these knights became easy targets for the English archers, who were strategically positioned on a distant hill. The English archers, their longbows ready and waiting, unleashed a hail of arrows upon the struggling French infantry. The result was a scene of chaos and disarray on the battlefield, eerily reminiscent of previous encounters. The French army, thwarted by treacherous terrain and a relentless barrage of arrows, found themselves in a dire predicament once more. The outcome of the battle hung in the balance teetering on a precipice of mud and misery. Chapter 12 A Surrender and a Treaty 
The Treaty of Bretigny Confronted with the grim reality of the battlefield and the dire straits of his forces, King Jean II of France faced a momentous choice. In a gesture laden with historical significance, he handed over his gloves to the English commanders. In the context of the Middle Ages, this act symbolized surrender, a profound and deliberate decision. Made not in haste but as a means to preserve lives. Surrendering as a prisoner on the battlefield offered a better chance of survival and the prospect of eventual release in exchange for ransom money. King Jean II's gloves Extended as a token of surrender Marked the turning point of the battle and the transition from a dire struggle to the prospect of captivity. The consequences of this pivotal decision were profound. Not only did King Jean II himself become a prisoner of England, but also his son, the prince, and a retinue of approximately 25 high-ranking nobles, accompanied by two knights who followed them, found themselves in captivity. This event represented yet another significant defeat for France. Recognizing the strategic opportunity that presented itself, England swiftly moved to capitalize on the situation. Negotiations ensued, resulting in a historic treaty between the two nations, the Treaty of Bretigny. This treaty brought about an end to the protracted and tumultuous conflict between England and France albeit temporarily. The Treaty of Bretigny brought about substantial changes in the landscape of their relationship. Firstly, it absolved the King of England of certain obligations and responsibilities toward the King of France. Secondly, France ceded a significant piece of territory known as Aquitaine to England. And thirdly, the King of England formally renounced his claim to the title of King of France, although he retained a symbolic connection to the French throne, characterizing himself as unquote, kind of like a king. Unquote, this treaty marked a pivotal juncture in the complex history of these two nations, shaping their relations and destinies for years to come. Chapter 13 Territorial Gains the Impact of the Treaty of Bretigny The Treaty of Bretigny brought about significant changes in the balance of power between England and France, with England securing substantial gains in the form of territory. The most prominent prize in this treaty was the acquisition of a vast expanse of land known as Aquitaine, a region that included strategically vital locations like Bordeaux. Approximately four years after the Battle of Poitiers, the Treaty of Bretigny emerged as a pivotal event. It marked a crucial shift in the geopolitical landscape, with England's territorial holdings in France expanding dramatically, almost quadrupling in size. In concrete terms, their controlled landmass increased to nearly four times its previous extent. To put this into perspective, England came to possess roughly one-third of all the land within France. The significance of the Treaty of Bretigny extended beyond mere territorial gains. It represented a profound turning point in the ongoing conflict between England and France. Through this treaty, both sides agreed to a temporary cessation of hostilities. France officially recognized England's claims to the expanded territories in Aquitaine, while England, in turn, relinquished its ambitions for the French crown. This treaty functioned as a pause button, affording both nations a momentary respite to recuperate after years of relentless warfare. For England, the benefits derived from the Treaty of Bretigny were substantial. 
The newly acquired territories in Aquitaine provided them with access to greater resources and influence within France. This land was not only strategically important but also rich in valuable resources, including fertile lands for agriculture, which could contribute to England's economic prosperity and overall power. However, it's essential to recognize that while the Treaty of Bretigny temporarily reduced the intensity of the fighting, it did not mark a permanent conclusion to the Hundred Years' War. Tensions and conflicts continued to simmer beneath the surface, and the flames of war would reignite in due course. In conclusion, the Treaty of Bretigny left an indelible mark on the dynamics of the Hundred Years' War. It facilitated England's consolidation of significant territorial gains in Aquitaine, enhancing their influence and resource base. Yet, it represented but a brief intermission in the overarching conflict between the two nations. As the story of the Hundred Years' War continued to unfold with its ebbs and flows of power and struggle. Chapter 14 The Price of Freedom King Jean II's Ransom So, what befell the captured King Jean II? He found himself a prisoner, albeit one treated with an unusual degree of courtesy in England. He retained a retinue of attendants and aides, creating an environment that almost resembled his former royal court. Despite his captivity, he was afforded a semblance of regal treatment, a calculated move on England's part to maintain a measure of control over the situation. However, there was a significant catch to his apparent comfort. England sought a substantial ransom in exchange for King Jean II's release, a formidable sum of money that amounted to a staggering fortune. To grasp the scale of this demand, Envision the weighty equivalent of 12 tons of gold. In more tangible terms, it was like amassing a treasury of 3 million gold coins. Meeting this exorbitant financial demand posed a formidable challenge. The French royal family could not muster the entire ransom amount in one fell swoop, for it exceeded the customary expenses of France over a span of two years. The quest to secure King Jean II's freedom became an arduous financial ordeal. In the end, King Jean II of France resorted to a complex arrangement. He delivered a partial payment of the ransom to the English prince and left his son as a kind of enquat, guest enquat, in England as collateral. Returning to France, he embarked on a relentless quest to gather the remaining ransom funds. Even though he held the exalted title of king, he lacked the financial means to meet the ransom demand in its entirety. Consequently, he was compelled to part with a substantial portion of his wealth and possessions in his determined bid to secure his freedom. The saga of King Jean II's ransom served as a poignant reminder of the high costs and profound sacrifices incurred during the turbulent years of the Hundred Years' War. Chapter 15 Complicated Alliances France's Turmoil and the Treaty of Tra What did King Jean II do when he found himself unable to gather the entirety of the ransom money? He did not concede defeat. Instead, he made a rather unexpected decision, he sent his son, Charles V, to reside in England as a form of gratitude towards the English. This choice might appear perplexing at first glance, but it serves as a testament to the intricate complexities that often define historical narratives. When Charles V's son, Charles VI, Eventually returned to France, he ascended to the throne as the new king. Charles VI was known for his acumen in making plans and decisions. 
he diligently worked to reclaim the territories in France that had fallen under English control. However, the fortunes of France took a turn for the worse when Charles VI began to suffer from a debilitating mental illness. His affliction led him to entertain bizarre notions, such as the belief that his body was made of glass, and he neglected his own well-being. Charles VI's mental deterioration plunged France into a period of profound turmoil. During this time, a powerful faction emerged, led by the Duke of Burgundy, who also happened to be the king's uncle. The Duke of Burgundy and his supporters effectively took charge of the governance of France. Nevertheless, internal conflicts persisted, and suspicions arose among the followers of the Duke of Burgundy who believed that the French royal family might be implicated in his mysterious death. Amidst these tumultuous events, the faction led by the Duke of Burgundy forged an alliance with England, further complicating the already intricate landscape of French politics. In England, a formidable king named Henry V rose to prominence. Henry V had never received the full ransom amount for King Jean II's release. Leveraging the pretext of the unpaid debt, Henry V embarked on a military campaign to France in 1415. Four years later, he achieved a significant milestone by capturing Paris, the heart of France, causing considerable alarm in the French ranks. Henry V's military successes heralded a pivotal transformation in the course of history. He sealed a momentous agreement known as the Treaty of Tra. This treaty bore profound implications for the future of both France and England, representing a critical juncture in the shared history of these two nations. Chapter 16 Joan of Arc Voices and Visions of Destiny Joan of Arc's story unfolded amidst the backdrop of the Hundred Years' War, a time when the flames of conflict engulfed France and England. She hailed from the humble village of Don Remy in eastern France, born to farmer parents. Her life, in its early stages, revolved around the pastoral tasks of tending to sheep in the fields. She did not enjoy the privilege of formal education, could neither read nor write, nor possess any extraordinary skills. However, at the tender age of 13, in the summer of 1424, Joan experienced something extraordinary. Joan recounted that when she was 13, Around the year 1425, a remarkable event unfolded before her eyes. She beheld the apparition of a special figure, St. Michael, who was surrounded by a celestial host of angels. This awe-inspiring encounter transpired in the serene confines of her garden. Overwhelmed by the experience, Joan was moved to tears. Her heart's desire being to accompany these celestial beings, the angels and Saint Michael. As Joan continued to mature, her visions persisted, with Saint Michael recurrently appearing in her visions. He assumed the role akin to a guardian or a protector, watching over the region of Dom Remy, and by extension, the entire realm of France. Joan's visions often coincided with the tolling of church bells, serving as a kind of divine signal or marker. The enigmatic sounds that resonated within Joan's ears carried a profound message. It seemed as though she had been entrusted with a divine mission, to rescue the beleaguered king of France from the perils that beset him. These auditory experiences felt like messages from God Himself. 
Over time, their intensity and clarity only deepened. And Joan became utterly convinced that the voice she heard was none other than that of an angel, bearing messages directly from the Almighty. With her faith and conviction unwavering, Joan of Arc resolved to take action. She embarked on a journey to a nearby place called Vaucouleurs, with a clear purpose in mind. Her message was simple yet profound. And quad, wait. Refrain from precipitous actions against the enemy. And exercise patience. God will extend his divine aid. And quad, she conveyed to those she encountered that the kingdom of France did not belong to the earthly prince but was a divine trust. And the king should place his unwavering faith in God's intervention. Joan of Arc's destiny, interwoven with the voices and visions that guided her, was poised to leave an indelible mark on the history of France. Chapter 17 Joan's Bold Transformation Defying Norms to Shape History Joan's tenacity knew no bounds, she persevered in her efforts to communicate with the leaders of the army. Perhaps they were moved by her unwavering commitment or recognized the sincerity of her mission. Eventually, the military captain yielded to her plea, agreeing to hear her message. In an era where women typically adorned themselves with long hair and donned dresses, Joan made a daring and unconventional choice. She cut her hair short and adopted the attire of men a departure from the established norms of her time. This bold transformation underscored Joan's unwavering determination and her readiness to challenge conventional perceptions in pursuit of her goal. With her cropped hair and masculine attire, she embarked on a mission that would ultimately rewrite history. The story of Joan of Arc serves as a timeless testament to the power of resolute beliefs unyielding determination and the courage to defy societal norms it imparts a profound lesson that even individuals considered unlikely or unexpected can catalyze significant change jones audacious journey would leave an enduring imprint on the annals of history inspiring generations to come chapter 18 jones encounter with charles the 7th a fateful meeting that changed destiny. After an arduous journey spanning 500 kilometers in her attire of men's clothing, Joan of Arc arrived at Chino, where the crown prince, Charles VII, resided. However, their meeting did not unfold as one might expect. Historical accounts present a story that many consider true. It is said that Charles VII came to ascertain Joan's authenticity, devised a test. He concealed himself among a group of individuals, his neck adorned with a wreath. Joan, guided by another worldly knowledge, unerringly approached him recognizing him as the crown prince. She then conveyed a message she claimed to have received from the Virgin Mary, a message proclaiming that Charles would ascend to the throne of France, donning the regal crown, and bearing divine authority. This pivotal encounter transpired at the royal court in the town of Chinot, in late February or early March of the year 1429. Joan was 17 years old at the time, while Charles was 26. During their meeting, Joan addressed Charles with profound significance. She conveyed her purpose, to aid in lifting the siege of Orléans and to guide him to the city of Reims for a coronation, where he would be anointed as the rightful king in a sacred ceremony. Joan and Charles engaged in a private conversation away from prying ears. 
This conversation had a profound impact on Charles. Later, Jean Pascrell, Joan's confessor, the individual she confided in regarding her beliefs, revealed that Joan had reassured Charles. She affirmed his true lineage as the son of Charles VI and proclaimed him the rightful sovereign of the realm. The meeting between Joan of Arc and Charles VII marked a fateful juncture that would forever alter the course of history. It set in motion a sequence of events that would have a profound impact on the destiny of France. Chapter 19 Joan's Trials and Triumphs Earning Trust and Leading to Battle One can only imagine the surprise and bewilderment that Charles VII must have experienced. Joan's message was nothing short of extraordinary. And it would have tested the bounds of belief for anyone. To verify the authenticity of her mission, Charles VII took a cautious approach. He sent Joan to Poitiers, a nearby location, where she underwent two significant tests. The first of these tests was known as the Enquat, Maiden's Test. Enquat, its purpose was to ascertain Joan of Arc's virginity. As it was believed that a lack of virginity might suggest a connection to malevolent forces, particularly the devil. The prevailing belief was that if Joan was indeed a virgin, she could not be associated with such malevolence. The second test involved a rigorous examination by priests and legal experts who posed a multitude of questions. Their objective was to determine Joan's moral character and the veracity of her claims. After a thorough and meticulous inquiry, they found no reason to doubt Joan's goodness or the truthfulness of her statements. It became increasingly apparent that Joan of Arc might be a valuable asset, particularly given the dire circumstances facing France at that time. Confronted with the pressing needs of his country, Charles VII made the decision to enlist Joan's assistance and placed her in a pivotal role in the critical Battle of Orléans. This marked the beginning of Joan's remarkable journey from an ordinary village girl to a symbol of hope and courage for the people of France. Chapter 20 Joan's Inspiring Leadership on the Battlefield Understanding Joan of Arc's role in battles is of paramount importance. Joan had not received formal training as a warrior, and she arrived at a time when the French castle was besieged by English forces for nearly 200 grueling days. The French soldiers were physically exhausted from the prolonged conflict, and their spirits were low. Having suffered numerous losses, however, something truly extraordinary transpired approximately a week after Joan's arrival. Amid the chaos of a challenging battle, Joan of Arc suddenly emerged, brandishing a flag and passionately urging the French soldiers to advance and engage the enemy. While artistic depictions of this moment may portray it as perfect, the reality was that it was a fierce and grueling battle. Nevertheless, Joan's mere presence provided the French troops with the strength and resolve they desperately needed. Joan's arrival on the battlefield transcended her physical presence, it was a manifestation of her leadership and the ray of hope she brought with her. She exemplified bravery by positioning herself at the forefront, confronting danger alongside her fellow soldiers. Her unwavering faith and determination served as a beacon, rekindling the morale of the French troops. Joan's words and actions instilled a renewed belief in themselves and rekindled the courage they needed to persevere. Imagine finding yourself in a situation where the odds appear overwhelmingly against you. You are tired, disheartened, and on the brink of giving up. Then, someone like Joan steps forward, radiating courage and conviction. 
instilling in you the belief that you can surmount the obstacles before you. That's the profound impact Joan had on the battlefield. Her leadership was nothing short of inspiring, encouraging those around her to rediscover their inner strength and determination. Even when confronted with seemingly insurmountable challenges. Chapter 21 Joan's Triumphs and English Skepticism Joan of Arc's initial victory marked the commencement of her extraordinary journey and had a profound impact on the French in their ongoing battles against the English. It conveys a powerful lesson. The courage and unwavering beliefs of a single individual can indeed alter the course of history. The unexpected success led by a young girl against the English left the Duke of Bedford, who was responsible for English affairs in France, perplexed. He struggled to comprehend how Joan of Arc had achieved this remarkable victory. It is important to recognize that during that era, people did not have the same understanding of the world as we do today, and supernatural explanations were often invoked. Some believe that Joan's triumphs might be attributed to dark magic or sorcery linked to malevolent forces like the devil. Such beliefs were rooted in a worldview that included demons and witches. Curiously, the English were not readily inclined to accept Joan's claims of divine guidance. They questioned the authenticity of the voice she asserted was from God or an angel. Instead, they entertained the possibility that it was a falsehood or even the voice of Satan. These doubts reflect the prevailing sentiments of the time. It's worth noting that some historical accounts from that period depicted Joan as a malevolent witch with the ability to cast spells. This provides insight into the official stance held in England during that particular era. Chapter 22 Joan's Symbolic Leadership and Continuing Legacy In the medieval era, a time steeped in beliefs of supernatural forces and divine intervention, the story of Joan of Arc took on a significance that is challenging for us to fully appreciate in our modern world. While Joan may not have held formal command over the entirety of the French army, her presence held a profound sway over the soldiers a power beyond the realm of ordinary human leadership. Though she didn't engage in direct combat, her role was, in essence, symbolic but undeniably powerful. Clad in armor and bearing a resplendent flag, Joan was the embodiment of courage and faith for the troops. Joan became a beacon of hope an emblem of impending victory, and her influence endured long after the battles had concluded. She was instrumental in the recapture of cities that had fallen under English control. Her presence alone often enough to inspire the beleaguered French forces to push back against their oppressors. Her unwavering faith in her divine mission was infectious, permeating the ranks and renewing their determination to fight on even in the face of seemingly insurmountable odds. Yet, what awaited Joan beyond these victorious battles was far from ordinary. Her story continued to unfold, each chapter revealing more about the remarkable life of this peasant girl turned heroine of France. The legacy she left behind was not merely one of military conquests and strategic brilliance but also of unyielding faith unshakable resolve, and unwavering dedication to her beliefs. Chapter 23 Challenges and Capture, The Changing Course of Joan's Military Journey Joan of Arc had undoubtedly played a pivotal role in securing Paris for Charles VII, bolstering his claim to the French throne and strengthening his position as king. However, as her military campaigns progressed, her once remarkable string of victories began to wane, and the tides of her fortunes shifted for various reasons. 
One significant factor contributing to Joan's dwindling successes was the transformation in Charles VII's approach to warfare after ascending to the throne. No longer as inclined towards aggressive military campaigns. The king increasingly sought diplomatic solutions and alternative strategies to achieve his objectives. This shift in focus had a direct impact on the way military operations were conducted. And Joan found herself gradually losing her influence in the decision-making process. Her role evolved to that of leading smaller, more specialized groups of soldiers, which presented a stark departure from her previous prominent position on the battlefield. As time pressed forward, Joan encountered mounting challenges in the field of battle. A pivotal moment in this changing landscape was her involvement in the Battle of Compiègne, where she led a relatively small contingent against a formidable enemy force. Outnumbered and outmatched, Joan and her troops were forced into a harrowing retreat, seeking refuge within the walls of Compiègne Castle. It was in this battle that the course of Joan's military journey took a dramatic turn. The Battle of Compiègne marked a significant setback, culminating in a somber moment in Joan's story. During her retreat, she found herself captured by the enemy forces. She fell into the hands of the Burgundians, arch rivals of the French, and was subsequently sold into the custody of the English. This fateful capture was a stark departure from the triumphs that had once defined her military career. The capture of Joan of Arc symbolized a poignant and tragic turning point in her remarkable life. It marked the end of her time as a military leader, leading her into a new and perilous chapter that would culminate in her trial and eventual execution. Chapter 24 Joan's Captivity and Charles VII's Response Joan of Arc The valiant young woman who had fought fervently for France's cause found herself in dire straits when she was captured by a coalition of forces led by Burgundy Fa and Brogan. These groups had allied themselves with England, throwing their support behind King Henry VI, who was favored by the English rather than Charles VII, the legitimate king of France. For Joan, this was a disheartening turn of events as she had ardently believed in Charles VII's rightful claim to the throne and had tirelessly fought for his cause. However, the response of Charles VII to Joan's capture raised questions and concerns among some. Critics argued that he did not exert significant efforts to secure her release or demonstrate strong leadership during this critical time. It appeared to many that he remained passive and unresponsive to the plight of the young heroine. His perceived lack of action and absence of visible emotions left some doubting his commitment to rescuing Joan and safeguarding the values she had stood for. Charles VII's seemingly subdued reaction to Joan's captivity cast a shadow over his leadership. Some viewed his failure to take decisive action or rally against his enemies as a sign of weakness. This perception fueled speculation and debate about his true commitment to the cause for which Joan had so passionately fought. As history would reveal, Joan of Arc's captivity and the mixed reactions it elicited would become a complex and enduring part of her story, shedding light on the intricacies of leadership and political maneuvering during a tumultuous period in French history. The true nature of Charles VII's response to Joan's capture remains a subject of historical debate, but it is undeniable that this chapter in their intertwined destinies would continue to shape their legacies for centuries to come. Chapter 25 Charles VII's Limited Ability to Help The friendship between Joan of Arc and Charles VII was undeniable. But when Joan fell into the hands of the English and their allies in 1430, 
the challenges facing her and Charles became immensely daunting. Charles Despite his genuine desire to assist Joan Found himself in a precarious position And several factors hindered his ability to provide substantial help 1. Trouble in the country France was far from stable at the time of Joan's capture Charles VII faced opposition from factions within his own realm who harbored discontent and did not fully support his claim to the throne. This internal strife made it exceedingly difficult for him to openly intervene on Joan's behalf. As her capture might have been perceived as a setback for his own side. 2. Diplomatic Considerations Charles VII had to engage in delicate diplomatic negotiations with multiple countries. Not just England. Striking a balance in these negotiations was essential to avoid jeopardizing relations with other foreign powers. Extending excessive aid to Joan might have risked souring these diplomatic ties. 3. Propaganda and Smear Campaigns the English captors of Joan launched a propaganda campaign to discredit her, portraying her as a liar and a wrongdoer. They disseminated stories designed to erode public trust in her. These narratives also sowed doubt among some of Charles VII's advisors, making them hesitant to champion her cause. 4. Resource Constraints Charles VII faced limitations in terms of finances and the availability of soldiers. He was already embroiled in a protracted conflict with the English. And internal issues strained his resources further. Acquiring the necessary funds and troops to mount a rescue mission for Joan proved to be a formidable challenge. 5. Fear of Escalation Charles VII's advisors were apprehensive that any attempts to save Joan might escalate hostilities with the English. They were cautious about taking actions that could potentially worsen an already dire situation. 6. Other Priorities Charles VII and his advisors had to juggle multiple pressing concerns. They may have regarded Joan's capture as a temporary setback in the grand scheme of their military and political objectives. Their focus was on broader strategic plans that extended beyond Joan's predicament. 7. Religious and Political Implications Joan's captivity was not solely a military issue, it carried religious and ecclesiastical significance as well. Charles VII likely had concerns about antagonizing the church or contravening its established rules in his efforts to secure her release. 8. Jealousy and Influence There is the possibility that jealousy played a role in Charles's response. Particularly as Joan's popularity and influence grew. Charles had faced doubts about his legitimacy as the crown prince. And Joan's rapid rise to fame and the admiration she garnered may have heightened his unease. In the end, Joan found herself in an extraordinarily challenging situation. And Charles VII, while undoubtedly sympathetic to her plight, faced a multitude of complex and often conflicting factors that constrained his ability to provide immediate and substantial assistance. While he eventually did make efforts to aid her, the circumstances were intricate, and swift and decisive intervention proved elusive. Joan's Capture A poignant chapter in her remarkable story showcased the intricate web of political, diplomatic, and military challenges that define this tumultuous period in history. Chapter 26. Joan of Arc's Unjust Trial, Fighting Accusations The officials tasked with overseeing Joan of Arc's trial were resolute in their mission to establish her as a heretic or a witch. For over five grueling months, Joan endured relentless questioning, 
resulting in the generation of more than 29 documents meticulously chronicling the trial's proceedings. These historical records still preserve today offer invaluable insights into the arduous and unjust circumstances that Joan faced during her trial. Originally recorded in medieval French, they were subsequently translated into Latin for formal documentation, collectively comprising approximately 630 pages. Throughout the trial, Joan of Arc found herself confronting a multitude of priests and legal scholars who posed intricate philosophical and theological queries. Despite her lack of formal education, the 19-year-old exhibited remarkable courage as she engaged in intellectual battles with these erudite individuals of her era. Despite the daunting nature of her interlocutors, Joan held her ground with unwavering confidence and composure. As the trial progressed, a staggering total of 70 accusations were leveled against her. These allegations included charges of witchcraft, making prophesies, and seeking aid from malevolent spirits to aid in battle through heresy. The weight of these accusations was grave and was aimed at discrediting Joan's unwavering faith and her extraordinary achievements. However, as the trial unfolded and Joan presented evidence of her virginity on multiple occasions, the charge of witchcraft became increasingly untenable. Ultimately, the charges were reduced to twelve, though the unjust nature of the proceedings remained glaringly apparent. Joan of Arc's trial serves as a somber chapter in history. A testament to the challenges faced by those who dare to defy societal norms and exhibit extraordinary courage. Her unyielding spirit and fearless defense in the face of unfounded accusations have left an indelible mark on the annals of history. Inspiring generations to come with her resilience and unwavering faith in the face of adversity. Chapter 27 Joan of Arc's Trial and Tragic End a pivotal point of contention during Joan of Arc's trial revolved around her decision to don men's clothing. In the context of the time, a woman wearing attire traditionally designated for men was viewed as a transgression against religious principles, rooted in certain interpretations of the Bible. This contentious issue became a focal point of her trial. Ultimately, on May 30th, 1431. Joan of Arc met a tragic end. Marked by her execution through burning at the stake in Rouen Square. A considerable crowd gathered to witness this solemn event. And a raised platform was constructed to provide a clearer view of the proceedings. Interestingly, unlike ordinary fires, Joan's pyre was ignited three times. This unusual repetition stemmed from the fact that the flames repeatedly extinguished themselves. Some have speculated that the English, who held her captive, were concerned about potential rescue attempts. Their aim was to ensure that nothing remained of Joan that could challenge the prevailing beliefs of the French populace. By reducing her body to ashes entirely, they hoped to prevent any relics that might become objects of veneration. Following the conclusion of the war, roughly three years later, Charles VII took the significant step of posthumously reinstating Joan of Arc and declaring her trial invalid. This move served not only to present him as a compassionate and just king but also to address the perceived flaws in her trial which had been conducted under the jurisdiction of a church court. However, this action came belatedly and carried symbolic significance. Despite being crowned thanks to Joan's efforts, Charles VII himself would later face accusations of heresy, illustrating the intricate and ongoing political manipulation of Joan of Arc's legacy. 
which continued long after her passing. Joan of Arc's tragic end and subsequent reappraisal serve as a poignant reminder of the complex interplay of politics, religion, and the enduring impact of an extraordinary individual whose life and deeds continue to resonate through the annals of history. Chapter 28 Joan of Arc A Remarkable Figure and Global Symbol Joan is considered a special person in the Roman Catholic Church. She was seen as a religious figure in a place called Orléans after she helped end a siege there. People would talk about how great she was during a yearly event there until the 1800s. In the year 1849, a bishop named Felix Stupenloop spoke about Joan. And people from different countries paid attention. Then, in 1869, he asked a place called Rome to start the process of making Joan a saint. Finally, in the year 1909, Pope Pius X declared that Joan was a blessed person. And later, in 1920, Pope Benedict XV made her a saint. People remember Joan on May 30th every year, which is when she was put to death. A pope named Pius XI said she was one of the special protectors of France in 1922. Although Joan was not officially called a Christian martyr, many people thought of her as one because she suffered for things like her strong beliefs, her modesty, and her country. She is also remembered in the Church of England, and even in the Kaodai religion. When Joan was alive, people compared her to important women from stories in the Bible. She claimed to be a virgin, which meant she was pure and good. Women from different sides of a big war believed in her and supported her, showing how special she was. Joan was a model for being a strong and independent woman in a time when men usually had more power. She did things that were usually considered for men, like leading an army. But she also stayed true to being a brave woman. She showed that both men and women could have important qualities. People have made many art and cultural things about Joan for a long time. In the 1800s, in France, people created lots of art like books, plays, and music, about her. Her story also became famous for art in Europe and North America. In the 1960s, thousands of books were written about her. Her influence spread all over the world, inspiring things like novels, plays, poems, movies, paintings, books for children, and even things like games, comics, and popular culture. Joan of Arc evolved into an enduring symbol, not just in France but across borders. During World War I, she became a beacon of hope, strength, and triumph. Her image appeared on postcards and even on you. S. Currency to raise funds for the war. Astonishingly, her influence transcended national boundaries. <laughs>